Welcome. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we're so delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. We certainly would love to hear from you. So send us an email with a question or a comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN. Dot com. And today our guest is Patrick O'Hearn. He is a husband, a father, an editor at Tan Books, and author of several books, including Parents of the Saints, The Hidden Heroes mm. Behind Our Favorite Saints, available at EWTNRC.com. And we certainly did enjoy uh, researching and reading and learning. It was really enriching and yeah. enlightening. I mean, you think of the saints, well, where did they come from? Who formed them? Mm -hmm. who, who molded them into be these holy women yeah. of God? Um, yeah. And not everybody came from perfect homes either. Yeah, when we first got the book, I wasn't <clears> sure, you know, what we had, and I just thought it would be, which is enough, stories of the saints. But then again, I mean, the main focus was the parents of these saints. Who mm -hmm. are they? So it's an amazing job that Patrick's done digging out all this, like, firsthand information on who the parents were. Some of them became saints themselves, and some of them just kind of unknown. What were they doing? What, what was their life about that it helped to form these saints that we know, whether it's, you know, Padre Pio or mm -hmm. uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux, whoever it is, that saint. Who are their parents? Mm -hmm. What was going on in their lives? And I love how he speaks about the saints based on, seven, I think it's seven hallmarks. Yes, it is, seven hallmarks. What were the hallmarks of those parents? Mm -hmm. What was the hallmarks of those homes? And so he talks about the sacramental life. What was the sacramental life like in the home of St. John Paul II, mm -hmm. of Padre Pio, of whomever, Maximilian Kolbe's parents? Who were who they? What was going on with the sacramental life, the Eucharist, Confirmation, Holy Orders, Holy Matrimony, Reconciliation, Anointing of the Sick? Second hallmark of families, surrender. Mm -hmm. So he speaks about the parents that in a special way were surrendering their lives in the context of their lives, how that impact, impacted the saints, that they would be people of surrender. Sacrificial love, hallmark three, suffering in the home, suffering of the parents in the home. How did that impact these people to become the saints that they were? Simplicity of life, solitude of life, the sanctity of human life. Mm -hmm. And so it was just really very wise the way he took those hallmarks. And it's not just stories about saints. So you see what was going on. And then we need to ask ourselves as parents, how are we? Are we intentionally and willfully trying to form our children? Mm -hmm. Any of these hallmarks represent us? How are we doing this? Maybe there are other hallmarks. But we need to know what we're doing because that main responsibility is given to parents to form their children. Right. And I can remember saying to our children, you know, when they would talk about things were going on at school or in the world, and, and I would say, hey, I am not raising you for this world. Mm -hmm. I'm raising you that you would have God's heart and you spend the eternity with me in heaven. That's our eternal home. So, but we have to work it out, right? Yeah. We have to work it out, hopefully, with truth and beauty yeah. and everything that is sacred and holy because we're just human beings and we're trying to get to be more like Jesus along the journey. And we have a responsibility in the domestic church. Amen. I want parents to realize that their greatest mission in life is to form saints. Patrick O'Hearn. You're not going to want to miss this show today. You want to form your children to be saints. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, you're at home with Jim and Joy, and today our guest is Patrick O'Hearn. He is a husband and a father and an editor at Tan Books. He's also the author of several books, including The Parents of the Saints, and this beautiful book is available at EWTNRC.com. And you might be looking for a great summer read with your family. It's a beautiful way to teach your children about this mother and this father and, and the way that these children came up and the way their parents formed and shaped and molded Old them. Old parents, grandparents should mm -hmm. have the book. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of homeschooling uh, parents as well, schools, Catholic schools, because it really is a, 
sort of a catechesis, if you're looking at mm -hmm. these folks on how, what they did, and boy, you can really extrapolate from that and say, let's implement some of these things. So it's great to have you with us. Thank yeah, you. now you tell our family a little bit about yourself, where you're from and your raising, and then what on earth inspired you to write this book? Sure. Yeah. So it's an honor to be here. I grew up in the Midwest, uh, currently reside in North Carolina. I'm a husband and father, and I'll be married seven years to, uh, to my beautiful wife, Amanda, mm -hmm. and we are blessed with one son on earth and two in heaven. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I, uh, I started a self-publishing company called Contemplative Heart Press, where I, I wrote two books. One was on uh, the nursery of heaven to help parents with, uh, that struggle with miscarriage, stillbirth, mm -hmm. and infant loss, and then also a children's book on one of the shepherds of Bethlehem. And then through a, a novena to Our Lady, um, a job opened up this past December at uh, Tan Books. So really honored to be an editor there. Beautiful. Oh, good. Well, tell us about mm -hmm. your journey in the writing of this book. You know, what was the, the germ for that? And as I was saying at the outset of the show, um, that's 50 parents of saints, 100 people. And that's a lot. And then you're not just speaking about the saints. There's a lot of writing about the saints, but you're talking about the parents. And as I was looking at this and getting to understand the book, I'm saying, wow, how did you dig that all out? How long did it take you? So why did you do it? How long did it take you to do it? Sure. Yep. All right, and to get back to uh, Joy's question about what inspired me, um, I was inspired. You know, I, I, I was so inspired by reading the lives of the saints growing up. And after I... Um, I, I, God called me to religious life. I was discerning there with three years with the Benedictine Monastery, and then uh, I discerned out of there, and I had difficulty relating to a lot of my uh, favorite saints, mostly because they were all religious, and they took a vow of celibacy. And so I wanted some saints to help me in my calling to the married vocation. And so in that process, as I was walking one day, I just felt the Holy Spirit put this book on my heart, and it took me about uh, three years to write. And a lot of um, the saints that I cover are my favorite saints, you know, St. Therese, St. Padre Pio, John Paul II. And then there's some lesser known ones like uh, Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, uh, Blessed Bartolo Longo, and many more. And, and just in, even in my, my upbringing with my parents, their inspiration to me, um, they, they were also, uh, I was really inspired by them as well to, to write this book. So. Well, it's, you're sharing about how this book came about really is spoken about in these parents and in these saints. Because I it was interesting, as you wrote about a number of these saints, and you have the hallmarks, we can go over those again. But there was a number of those parents that believed they may have had a religious calling. And, and then you start asking, I started asking myself the question, well, Maximilian Kolbe's mother believed she was, we wouldn't have Maximilian Kolbe if that mm -hmm. happened. And there's several instances of that. And that's your case as well. You thought you had a calling to the religious life. You really tested that out. And then sometimes we think, well, if you really want to be a Superman Catholic, you got to be in a religious order. You got to sort that out. The greatness of marriage, the vocation, the call to marriage. And if God so blesses to have children, that may be formed at the saints. So speak about that, your own journey, and, and, yeah. and, and saying, hey, I think it's an important word for all people thinking about marriage, which is so out of fashion these days. And you get some people that deeply get converted and say, I gotta go into a religious life, I gotta be a priest, I gotta be a sister. Yeah, definitely. You know, St. Therese's mom and dad, they both wanted to be religious, and St. Therese's mom was in tears on her wedding night because she still wanted to be a nun. And it was only after that she had children <laughs> that she said, I do not regret having, you know, I do not regret this calling. And so there was always that struggle, that longing for solitude. And, it, and the same with Maximilian Kolbe's mother. She wanted to be a nun. And because of the oppression by the Russians, she was unable to enter religious life. And then as I mentioned in the book later on, she actually, it was, it's a weird situation, but she became like a, a semi, like a, a nun. She wasn't taking vows, but her and her husband, they were still married. But she just she was able to go to um, an order and live out kind of a religious life. Wow. So she did have that her 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 dream came true. It's kind mm -hmm. of an it's kind of a different situation. I don't know if it's highly recommended, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. But it worked for her. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell our family how Mother Angelica, how her advice helped shape this yeah. book for you. Yeah, Mother Angelica said, 
Um, she goes, I wish many years in purgatory, and I, th and I was talking to Father Joseph last night, and I think it was 30 years in purgatory to those who sugarcoat the lives of the saints. So in this book, I wanted to include the many great things they did, but I also wanted to include some of the mistakes that they made, just to show that really there's only two perfect parents, and that's uh, Joseph and Mary. Mm -hmm. The rest of these parents, they struggled, uh, but the, the most important thing they did was they, they kept they got, they got back on their feet again, and they kept praying, and they made the Eucharist the heart and soul of, of their yeah. spiritual life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's, that's a very important point. So you bring that out in the parents. That helps us as parents, you know, because we know we're not perfect, and we wonder, how much damage have I done here? But we got to try to get up. we got to continue to persevere. And in that, even, you know, kids seeing their parents failing, getting back up, hopefully going to confession, mm -hmm. repenting of sin, getting back up. That's most of our lives anyway, you mm -hmm. know, I in the faith. Mm -hmm. You know, we just think, yeah, like this halo around these people all the time. But it really is a matter of, you know, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do do. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Because it was St. Paul that said that. And so you take in wonderful parents and you take in parents with difficulty. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, tell us about how you came to select some of the parents. Yeah. How did you do that? Because it took you a while to get this book done. Yeah. It's funny. I always say the saints choose us, you mm -hmm. know, in life. You think about even our confirmation name. And, and, and I, I felt that my whole life, just like even St. Therese's parents selected me. And often during, you know, whether it was daily mass, I would, I would hear this, it was a saint's feast day. And then a, a certain homily would come up about that saint. And then after a while, just be in prayer. And I would often hear, I mean, I didn't hear audibly, but just in my heart, talk about my parents, mm -hmm. research my parents. And so that's why the book took me like three years, because, you know, I could have stopped within a year and maybe just mm -hmm. done like 10. But I just felt the <laughs> Lord's like, there's so many of these. And, and it's like, God's like, I want them to be revealed in this moment in history. And so that's how the saints came. A lot of them were my favorite ones, but also there was lesser known ones. As uh, you know, I mentioned, there's, um, I think, St. Margaret of Costello. Mm -hmm. She's mentioned in there, and I use her as an example because yeah. her parents were not so good. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us why they were not so good. Yeah, because blessed, uh, or Saint, she just was recently canonized, mm -hmm. St. Margaret of Costello. She's the patron of the pro-life movement. Uh, she was um, thrown into, um, I think it's, I can't think of the name, but it's a room offside of a, a chapel. They pretty much abandon her, and then they're seeking a miracle because she was born as a hunchback, and, and they put her um, later at a tomb of a, a famous saint, and there was no no miracle, so then they just let her go. Wow. So they pretty much abandoned their daughter. Wow. Yeah. That's painful. Yeah. Well, I, I thought you were having seven hallmarks. Yeah. You know, it was just, I wouldn't say, well, I guess it's a genius or wise mm -hmm. to do that. Because it just put a whole different way of doing the readings on these parents of the saints and the saints yeah. themselves. Because you could see, you're, you're trying to say, I guess, here's a key aspect of the lives of, the, of this family, of these people, or of, of the parents. And so just touch base on, on those seven again, if you would, for us. Sure. Yeah, so the first hallmark is the sacramental life. And in that one, I talk about all the sacraments in there, and, and primarily, you know, just stories on the Eucharist. You know, how St. Gianna Mola's parents, they would wake up and go to daily mass, Padre Pio's. And then even with the sacrament of the anointing of the sick that's involved in that one, how um, St. Zelie, she and her husband, they made sure their neighbors got the last rites. And even just seeing, even talking about St. Zelie, as we mentioned earlier right. um, before the show, that she had this serenity in the face of death, and so many people are, are afraid to die. And, and that, was a, that, that was a great lesson. And then the next hallmark I talk about is um, surrender. And surrender is important, you know, is in terms of St. Therese's parents with their vocation and also losing a child. And then after that, we have sacrificial love, just the, the hidden sacrifices, mm -hmm. the things we see of, you know, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Her mother would actually bathe this, this one woman that she was an alcoholic that had sores over her. So when Mother Teresa went to Calcutta, the mm -hmm. lessons she learned was from her home. Mm -hmm. Her mother was doing that. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth hallmark is suffering. Um, and, and again, I talk a lot about child loss, losing a spouse in there. And then the fifth one is um, simplicity, just you know that, that ability to live a simple lifestyle. And then the sixth hallmark is um, solitude. 
just the importance of prayer. Mm -hmm. And then the final one is the sacredness of life. So they all kind of build towards that sacredness yeah. of life. Well, it, you know, it That's seems great. like that, that was easier to do back then. Now we're bombarded, right, with so much noise in the world and so many screens. Like, you have to arrest the culture just to bring mm -hmm. solitude. And, and so how, how can parents, like, read this book, be encouraging, or think, oh, my gosh, I'm, gonna, I'm falling so short. But it really is basic, simple mm -hmm. things, right? Absolutely. Um, in terms of solitude, some of the saints would do spiritual reading. That was like St. Gianna's mother. It was, you know, just 15 minutes each night. She'd read a book. And then you had um, Pope St. Celestine, who's one of the only popes to, to retire from the papacy outside of, you know, maybe God willing, you know, Pope Benedict will be a, a saint someday. And she would, she would spend in, uh, time in solitude. And then St. Gabriel of Our Lady of Sorrows, his father was, uh, he was a mayor in the city of uh, Assisi, and every morning he would spend an hour in prayer before mm -hmm. work. Yeah. But there was little things, that spiritual reading, mm -hmm. uh, that, that would definitely help with the solitude. I yes. love the story about uh, Fulton Sheen, right? And you, you share so well about, and you, you, I mean, until I read that, I never thought about him being raised and trained mm -hmm. and his mother and their influence, because, I mean, he's larger than life. But somebody had to form him and mold him and shape him. And he, he was a farm boy, and he learned a lot of those things out on the farm mm -hmm. that he then brought. So tell our family a little bit about Fulton Sheen's family. Yeah, it, his parents were not highly educated at all. I think they had a middle wow. school education, and they made sure that him and his siblings all were educated. And so they farmed, and I think they had a shop at one point, and Fulton Sheen did not like working on the farm. Mm -hmm. That was something he kind of detested. He, you know, it's always the same with priests. They're like, my hands are made for uh, chalices, chalices, not <laughs> calluses. That's right. <laughs> and one time he even stole something, and as a young boy, and his mother made him go back and pay like double the amount that he stole. And it was just like, it may have been a geranium or something mm -hmm. from the store. So I think that to instill those morals in him. And yeah. it was also interesting about them is they prayed that he'd become a priest, mm -hmm. but they never once told him that. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important as parents not to live vicariously through your children. Often, you know, I think that there's a chance, like maybe if I wasn't called to be a priest, well, then I'm going to force my children's to be, children to become priests. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Fulton Sheen's parents did not do that. They prayed and they asked God that he become a priest, but they never um, pressured him. Yeah. And I guess we're doing a lot with solitude. Again, one of the hallmarks, and there's seven hallmarks that kind of typify the family or the parents, the impact upon the saint, and maybe they carry that away with them. And it was really powerful to hear about Stanislas and Mariana Kowalewska, St. Faustina's parents, right? And so she's fantastic as, you know, an intercessor, you know, religious order person, but you have her sharing about her father. She says, when I saw how my father prayed, I was very much ashamed that after so many years in the convent, I was not able to pray with such sincerity and fervor. And so I never cease thanking God for such parents. I mean, that's really kind of the meaning of your book, isn't it? That and I never would have thought, and nobody knows really her parents, but she's saying, I, w I was never able to attain anything like my father's prayers, the impact of a father praying on a saint, what would become a saint. Mm -hmm. Makes all perfect. the difference, doesn't it? It does. You gotta do it. It's not only teaching and bringing forth something, but it's being seen. And probably most of these people never knew they were being seen, you know? And I think of, of my own father, who is not, uh, all that overtly a religious guy, but I just remember a moment of him when we went to Mass, and not that we made Mass every Sunday either, but he was there one time, and he was just right before, right before the Mass began. He had rosary beads in his hands. He was looking up at the crucifix, and I looked at him. This is just one time, and I don't think there was ever a mystic that looked any more in union with God than he did. That sticks with me all the days of my life, the importance of parents, right, and what they do in a flash, in a moment, and how that impacts the child, the saint. Right, all those influences, how we have to pray, how we have to go to mass, how we have to surrender, how we have to sacrifice. So many ways, I mean, especially we have beautiful Joseph and Mary in their ways of sacrificing and 
raising our Jesus, um, but ordinary parents are doing the same thing, trying to be a holy family too, and trusting that a greater good is going to come out of all this. And they don't know, right? You're just trying to be faithful to what God's told you to do with this We're child. We're going to take a break at this point. We're going to hold you over to the next segment. And so there's plenty more to come. Speaking with Patrick O'Hearn about his wonderful book, Parents of the Saints, the Hidden Heroes behind our favorite saints. You can be a hero too. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Plenty more to come. Welcome back. We are at home with Jim and Joy, and today our guest is author Patrick O'Hearn, and we're talking about his great book on raising saints, the parents of the saints. Did you ever think about that? Like, where did these holy people come from? Well, they came from really ordinary human beings that God blessed yeah. greatly. And um, these children were formed in homes with a mother and a father. And sometimes there were many children in the home, yeah. right? And uh, we're speaking about the hallmarks of that home, the impact of the parents on the children. Um, so we were speaking about the sacramental life. We're speaking about surrender, about sacrificial love, suffering, simplicity, solitude, sacredness of life. So let's just touch base. Any thoughts you have or anything you want to bring up about suffering as a hallmark of what was happening in the lives of those saints and in the parents and in that home and how that helped to form that saint? There's a quote I put in there from St. Faustina, but just said that suffering is the greatest treasure on earth. And that, that quote really it struck me because throughout the book there, you know, and often raising a saint, you know, people, we, we see the final product more like, oh, it'd be great to raise a saint, a Padre Pio, but we forget the suffering that's involved. Mm -hmm. and, and in our church today, you know, many people have lost a child or they've lost a spouse. And so there's stories throughout these lives of these parents of them losing a spouse. You know, uh, St. John Bosco's uh, mother, she lost her husband. Yes. And, uh, you know, John Paul II's father, you know, losing his wife. And then also St. Therese's parents, you know, yeah. losing, they lost four children. And so the suffering touched them in a way that um, I think that, that gives us an example as, as, as parents to realize we're, we're not alone you know, in our tribulations, that yeah. we, can, we can look to these parents yeah. as and, examples. And I think also with the Martins, um, when Zelly passed away, is it Louis, the husband, who are now saints themselves, right? Yeah. But Therese says he was unconsolable. I mean, the loss of, of a spouse and, and true love that's in there. Um, so you stated some of the ways of suffering, and, you know, that's something that we want to cast off as people. You know, we just don't want the suffering um, aspect, and, you know, we've all had that in our lives, some to a greater degree. And, and really, that's John Paul II spoke about the gospel of suffering. You know, for some people, they, they would think that's kind of weird, odd, strange. But yet there's a gospel of suffering and uniting that to the Lord, isn't there? But you're saying that, witnessing that, whether the children were watching the parents go through this and, and the loss and then persevering on, having all the emotions and feelings that go with it, but loving the Lord and what that did in their lives is profound. Yeah. yeah. You know, one of my favorite stories is there is St. Jose Maria Escriva. His father was cheated out of his business. They were you know, pretty wealthy, and then they had to sell their house, move away to a small apartment. And he said, I, I always saw my father with cheerfulness, even in his suffering. And he, you know, he died in his 50s. He's worn out, and the suffering eventually killed him. But I think that, that that's the example these parents gave. Even you know, John Paul II, you know, seeing his father on his knees at night praying after you know, they lost their mother, after John Paul lost his mother. And, and the fact that, you know, I think that that enabled John Paul to suffer well as an adult. So when, when you see your parents suffering, it, and it's not just suffering for the sake of suffering. I, I like how uh, Zelly Martin said, she's like, I never pray for suffering. You know, mm -hmm. God knows we, we have enough suffering. He gives it to us. Um, but the fact that we can uh, respond in joy 
um, yes. as best as we can and, and not to not to get discouraged yes. and to despair mm -hmm. in the, because I think what happened is that suffering it detached these parents from earth as well as their children. Patrick, thank you so much for beginning to open up this book, Parents of the Saints. We look forward to continuing our conversation tomorrow. Parents of the Saints, the hidden heroes behind our favorite saints. Go to EWTNRC.com. May God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones and those who are loving children. May you form them into saints. As Mother Angelica always would say, become a saint. Be a saint. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.